Hey there, uh, this is the first inaugural episode of Sorry for Rambling, uh, and I am joined today uh, by someone I'm very grateful to have, uh, Justin Wooten, all the way from South Carolina, uh, talking about his bid to be their next U.S. Senator. Justin, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Congratulations on the kickoff of this little podcast uh, series. That's pretty awesome of you to do, so... Yeah, well, I uh, I kind of have to. <laughs> uh, like, I'm, at like some point, I'm obligated to like make something because I have a certain number of internet followers, and I have no idea what else to do with them. Uh, but uh, I keep pissing them off otherwise. So it seems like a, a broader way to do that. I understand. Uh, I almost also like felt obligated to run uh, for the Senate because. Uh, to me, voting and protesting and writing your, you know, representatives, none of that has worked. So, you know, we got to get some actual people in there to run to represent the people. So, so that, that I mean, that is obviously, that's like the first question, because you're a first time candidate. Is that correct? Yeah, I've never done this. So, I mean, what was the, what was the motivation? Like, what was the moment where you were? Just like, I'm going all in. I'm going to run for U.S. Senate. I was kind of pondering it over Christmas break, I guess, in, in 2018. Once I saw AOC win and, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders has this huge following. And so I, I feel like, you know, real grassroots, real progressive, you know, populist economic uh, policy platform can can win. Uh but, you know, in South Carolina, I was like, how, how would that be possible? But um, I was kind of pondering, like, maybe I'll do something. And then Jamie Harrison uh, announced, and I was like, okay, if, if he's going to be, uh, you know, a good Democrat to run, then I'll just jump behind him. I don't really feel the, the need to run, uh, you know, put myself through all the mudslinging and stuff that might happen eventually. But um but then as his policy platform became more clear, or maybe less clear, I guess, um, I just felt like, come on, you know, we, we've had enough of the centrist, just Republican light uh, people, and they have lost you know, thousand plus seats over the, the years. Um, and they just um, compromise the Republicans right up front and, and nothing gets done. And we see evidence of that everywhere. So I felt like somebody had to step up and, you know, the, the saying is be the change you want to see. So I just said, screw it. And I, and I threw my hat in the ring too. So what was that? I mean, what was that conversation process like when you were deciding that you were the person that was going to challenge Harrison and hopefully ultimately challenge Lindsey Graham? I mean, were you talking to like family, friends? I mean, did anyone, you know, like try to pump the brakes on you or were people just all in? No, um, I'm relatively antisocial just in general in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't really talk this through very thoroughly with, with anyone. I just pondered it in my head, you know, and, and mentioned it to my wife. And, you know, she was hesitant at first, too. But, but eventually I just said, you know, I've got kids um, and somebody has to step up to the plate to where, you know, them and their, you know, their generations and, and any after that are going to have something that's really worthwhile um, to live. So whether you're talking about climate or healthcare or education or homelessness, I mean, it goes on and on. So, uh, yeah, I'm really just trying to be here to, to make a better future for people. So, I mean, and, and you would hope that that's the impetuous between behind anyone running for office right i mean that's that's hopefully kind of their goal um so you're married you have kids tell us right. a love story like, <laughs> how'd, how'd you meet? okay i mean this kind of thing to me <laughs> again a little anti-social i get it um you know people a lot of politics is kind of popularity contest so i, I get it uh, but you know, you know when the i guess cnn or whoever it was asked um Ch uh, cory booker about you know, oh, are you going to be married in the White House? I was like, come on, you didn't talk about that over, you know, I don't know, gun policy or anything. Um, but no. <laughs> so to me, like, personal stuff is not as important as policy, but 
you know, it's not like I'm hiding anything. So sure, uh, let's talk about my personal life a little bit. Um, yeah, so my wife, um, we met in middle school actually and started dating in the 10th grade. And then um, we've been together since. <laughs> so we got married in 2014. We had, had our daughter by then already in 2013. And we just had a son last year too. So we're it's uh, amazing. So yeah, so two kiddos, wife. Uh, I'm kind of like hitting a few firsts in in my family. You know, like we're homeowners now. Uh, I'm about to get my degree because I still don't have a degree. Life happens. <laughs> yeah, um, that's same. I'm I'm a uh, you know returning undergrad for the fourth time. <laughs> yes, I just turned 32, and so this is my. I'm taking one class this semester and it's my final one. So I'm finally going to be done with it. <laughs> Thank God. It's expensive. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if they don't really, they don't, they don't tell you that, but it's a, uh, it's expensive. Uh, they do tell you that. Unfortunately, that's all you're beat to death with is, uh, you know, go, 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 go. How to file. the only paperwork they teach you in high school on how to file is to file paperwork to take out loans for college. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> so what are you going to do about that? Uh, well, I support free college and trade school for all, just like Bernie Sanders has been pushing. Again, he just opened my eyes and tons of people's eyes, I think, in the 2016 run, where we, you know, uh, we were largely ignorant of how much different things are over in Europe, for example. Well, they have health care for everybody. They have free college for everyone. You just, it, it's an investment in the people, and it'll make pay off, you know, in the uh, country's future. And whether or not we are the ones who come up with, you know, cure for cancer or, or whatever you, you know, have it. But uh, it, it's just an investment ultimately in the people rather than um, corporate profits. And and it goes on and on. So defense contractors, yada, yada. So as, as a policy, how, how would you prefer to see it structured, though? I mean, would you prefer like a tuition reimbursement program or like a straight tuition payment to the universities or? or block grants. I mean, there's so many different options that have been discussed. It seems like everyone's got kind of a different idea on how to do it. What would be your proposal on the, the nuts and bolts of how you're going to pay for college for everyone in America? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a good question. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Um, whatever way is kind of least prone to abuse and corruption, I think is probably the best way to go. So, you know, voucher programs, I don't uh, feel all that comfortable with uh, for somehow. Somehow I feel like they would, would be easy to take advantage of. So if it's just a, a direct payment to the school that you apply, you know, through fast school or something like that, and they'll pay directly to the school for your tuition, that's already in place. Why not just make that, you know, the, the thing to make the money flow? So. Yeah, and I, I think you're. I mean, you're right. I mean, I mean, look at you know, just like I mean, with the student loan payment system. I mean, with the with, you know the refunds. I mean, people get them, and it's. I mean, it is their money to keep until they pay it back. But you know, you don't want something kind of happening with a voucher system where people are out just you know buying whatever the hell they want and not, ultimately not going to school. I guess. I do think part of the issue that you know people uh, more to the center in our party, people on the completely on the other side of the aisle tend to have and repeat is they, you know, when, when it comes to free college, they look at that price tag and, you know, they're, they're kind of their, their eyes spin around five times and then a little mushroom cloud comes off the top of their skull. Right. But is, isn't part of the issue. I mean, the, the, the tuition cost itself has raised so much. I mean, is, is there, is there something we can do in your mind to lower that, simultaneously while we pay for pay for people to get an education and better their lives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most schools out there are for profit schools and if you're going to have um, tuition free public college and university and trade schools, then they should be public and nonprofit in my opinion, if they're going to get federal dollars to, to put kids through it, people through education and stuff. They don't need to be a uh, for-profit um, thing, so that will cut a lot of contracts out right there. Um, 
I don't know all the reasons why uh, tuition has been going up over the years. I've experienced it on where you have just within our college stint. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Lowering the costs, obviously, but it's not like we can't afford this. I mean, we make up money for all kinds of things, um, military budgets, and you know, Congress just appropriates the money to do it. And so we could do this too. I don't see any reason why not. I mean, I mean, ultimately, I believe you're correct. Um, you you do. I mean, kind of harping on that. Uh, I mean, you support much like I do a bunch of very expensive you know, policy proposals. Uh, that's the questioning you're going to face, you know, be it from Harrison or from Graham or, or from the public at large or other uh, talking head losers like myself. Um, you know, it, it, it's always, it's not just the, how are we going to pay for it? But you know, there's questions about, you know, the, the debt and deficit and, and you know, what type of future we're leaving for people in that sense? Or are we, you know, paying for things on a credit card for them only to leave them with the bill when we're all, you know, long gone. How do you address those types of criticisms of, of your policies? I mean, I mean, what is your plan? Do you think that it's a valid criticism? I don't really think it's a valid criticism in the first place. So um, I don't know how familiar with, with um, some of the economic theory you are, or it's between Keynesian or down for the new um, but we can go into that a little bit if we want. Essentially, if the federal government holds the debt, that's a surplus of money for citizens, the population, and businesses in the private sector. So it's not really that um, that we owe money. Uh, it, it's just the government issue currency out into the economy for it to be spent and passed around between hands, and they take the money back and pass it. And so really, it, if we try to go for the zero-sum game of uh, trying to eliminate the debt and you know get to get the negative deficit to get there, all we're doing is essentially taking money out of the economy and it's just gonna leave the people and even businesses uh, dry. So, I don't agree with that premise at all. Well, and I think there's, I mean, there's a conversation happening now and you look at like new monetary theory, um, kind of factors into it. Uh, but, um, but I mean, realistically, I think there's a conversation happening about, is it even possible to pay off the debt? You know, I mean, it, you look at these ebbs and flows, right? Where, where, you know, there'd be deficit spending debt would accrue. But then, you know, through a combination of, you know, government stimulation of the economy, just overall productivity moving forward, you know, and trade, all kinds of things, it would balance out. And then under Reagan, you start to see it just inflate at these just massive numbers to a point where we're sitting here now. I don't know if it's possible to, to realistically say, well, we're going to zero it out and still have the government function at all. Yeah, I agree. I mean... I don't know the exact numbers, but Japan is running a debt way bigger than ours, and they're doing just fine. It's not uh, it's not a problem really to run it at a debt and at a deficit as long as you're spending the money on something that's going to help people, you know, instead of just wars and destabilizing the rest of the world essentially. Uh, and that's not going to help us. It's making us less safe, and then we're not using that money, which we should be uh, for the people here. So I, I don't think there's any problem in running uh, deficits and on a debt. And um, this austerity mindset to just cut the numbers when really, what, what does that mean in people's day-to-day -day lives if the government has a debt or not? It, it doesn't affect us on a day-to-day -day level. Well, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think you're kind of hitting, at least in my opinion, at the core of the thing, which is like war is the real issue, not just in the increase of the debt itself, but I mean, it's... It, I, Every time I hear one of these budget hawks on the right talk about the fact that the debt is an issue, uh, they're mainly talking about China, and they're mainly talking about the reason that we have hostile relations with China. You know, that's when it becomes a problem. If we're just making our payments to them, and we have a great relationship, we're engaged in trade and commerce, our political leaders are getting along, 
there's no real issue with having debt, debt and owing them debt and making the payment. It becomes an issue when we start having a breakdown in those relations. Uh, you know, when they start calling those debts uh, or when they start not loaning us money, you're stepping into the political arena on a national level. What are your opinions on how to prevent something like that? Like, how do we have the best relationship with a country like China possible? You know, what are your goals for the U.S. and China as a, a Senate hopeful? Um, that's an interesting conversation between a few levels. Um, I want to obviously foster diplomacy between us and all the other major players here in the world. Um, right now, the U.S. We really um, I take advantage of other countries. Uh, we, you know, take their resources and we occupy them. We have unfair trade agreements with them where we exploit their labor for our companies to make massive profits. So there's a, a lot of things that that we're doing wrong, I think, and we need to to be realistic and you know have really a, 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 a look into at ourselves in the mirror and see you know we really should be playing more fair. Secondly, uh, the thing about China owning owning our debt, I mean, really, what does that do to the? Uh, <laughs> I mean, all it is is that the U.S. government has a uh, uh, you know, like a bond or something. Promise, China has this many U.S. dollars. But what what good are U.S. dollars to China? Really, the only thing they can do with them is, is buy oil, because so that's the the reserve currency for oil right now in the world. But I mean, right now that's just like I said, another kind of almost exploitative relationship that we have with China, and that's just one aspect. Another aspect of that. Uh, it, if our relationship with China declines, then the dollar for them is kind of going to be useless, uh, in my opinion. So it, it's not. I don't. I don't know why China is going to our debt. It doesn't make sense. I don't think it's a good thing for them to have. It's kind of just like they're suckers almost because they they buy this debt from, from the U.S. So I don't know. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many layers of complexity to like Sino-American relations for so many decades, um, you know, and and it's hard to, because like our policies have changed so, in regards to China, so rapidly from administration to administration, whether they're economic or or on a human rights basis, um, whereas like China's for a couple decades now has been like very singularly focused on like economic gain and advantage. Um, and it's it's an interesting uh, a model, you know. I get I get criticized on the left because like I I think it's fine to be critical of China's government. I think it is. Um, that doesn't mean I think we should be hostile with them or adversarial with them. Like they are at this point, we kind of need to be allies with them, and they need to be allies with us. Um, but I think part of that is is having a healthy dialogue. And one thing I see are our politicians on both parties and, and really across the spectrum in the mainstream do you know not doing is talking about how do we improve relations with China? You know, everything is about how we prevent them from doing something or how we prevent them from gaining a certain edge on us. That's not as a voter what I'm interested in. How do we improve relations there? And how do we maybe improve conditions there? I mean, is there something legislatively that you think that, you know, if you were elected to the Senate that you could do to push that forward? Um, well, I mean, the TPP would have been a disaster, but one thing it would have done would have been to increase, you know, good relations between the two countries. If you're trading goods, then, you know, it's a much less likely chance you'll, you'll end up going to war or, or, you know, having hostilities between them. So I think we could work out some kind of trade agreement that's not really like the trade uh, the TPP, where you know companies would be able to to um, nominate I guess um, committee members on you know a um, arbitration board if uh, you know a company is going to sue the United States or something then the company was able to pick those people on that uh, arbitration board, so that was obviously a a, a problem. But if we did a trade deal that had environmental regulations and included, 
that had labor regulations included, we could work something out to where it would be beneficial for both countries, I think. And that would so is that something that, that you support is the, uh, the use of trade agreements to broker peace, essentially? Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as the agreement, like I said, is something that's going to be uh, pro environment and pro labor, I don't see why we why we couldn't trade. You know, you know, one thing that always catches me with uh, with trade agreements in general uh, is, you know, I mean, you mentioned pro labor. Our trade agreements are are not pro U.S. labor, uh, but how do we make them beneficial not just to U.S. labor, but to to foreign labor as well. Uh, how do we make them not exploitive uh, overseas? Um, it's complicated. Uh, so one thing I think we should do right now, if I'm not mistaken, the World Trade Organization, uh, when there's a trade between two countries, they used to have to verify with the slip or whatever that says, you know, Ecuador is giving the United States um, a shipment of 500 blankets. It used to be the World Trade Organization had to verify, oh, uh, they're, they're actually sending us 500 blankets. But now uh, they, they are, I think, specifically barred from checking that transaction and verifying it. So you could have a slip where it says, um, Ecuador is sending the United States um, 500 blankets, uh, but in reality, they're sending us like 2 million blankets or something. And the price, they can't verify the price versus um, the good. So if we're going to have fair trade relations between countries where they're not exploitative, then we need to, I think, reverse that decision um, where we actually check and verify um, trades internationally. Um, yeah, that's, that's just a starting point. I'm not sure where else to go with it. It's, I mean, there's... We could probably self-impose some kind of, um, you know, thing where we don't overvalue or devalue their products. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not like 100% versed in all of this stuff. So I I respect for the record. I, I actually think that you had some good ideas there. But I I want to just call out that last point. I I very much respect you as a politician for being willing to say that. Uh, that that's something that just it doesn't it doesn't happen nearly often enough and i think you know when you have these criticisms of of political leaders uh you know avoiding questions or, or not giving a straight answer people don't realize how often it's simply because they're not an expert on that specific topic but they don't want to let the voting public know that right um, you seem comfortable with that you seem comfortable saying i need to read more on this subject yeah, I mean, none of us can know everything, right? <laughs> so, so I, I want to tie back to something we talked about earlier um, that seemed to make you uh, deeply uncomfortable, uh, which is why I want to tie back to it: um, the the personal versus the political. Uh, you know, that, that that's all well and good to to run on policy, but to some extent, voters need to to buy you as a person. Um, why do you think that is and and what do you think are your strengths in that in that sense well i mean the personality matters to an extent to where you you need to be able to to trust the person um you know as somebody who doesn't have a political like voting record it's hard to just say oh, I, I trust this guy or you know uh someone like bernie bernie who's been voting on things for 40 years, then you really know their policies kind of are their per personality uh, and you have something to look back and, and you know, really feel comfortable trusting the person. Um, so I, I get it to a degree, um, personality does matter. But I mean, if, you know, if somebody's a dickhead, but they're still gonna give you health care, I, I don't really care that they're a dickhead. I mean, you know what I mean? Well, where where is the line on like dickish behavior that's acceptable from a public official, though, right? Because you could have someone who who has really great policies, uh, and <laughs> checks all the boxes, but you know you could also find out that they I don't know hit their kids 
20 years ago or, you know, committed fraud or, or, or God, I don't know, or, or just don't tip their servers, you know, like, wait, where, where, where's the line on what's acceptable? Is there? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. Like, good question. I mean, it depends on who, who you're asking, I guess, because, you know, if you have somebody who's, um, uh, you know, a very religious person, then they're going to be called, you know, or, or considered a dickhead to the non-religious people or the secular people who think um, government and religion should be separate, which I agree with. Uh, or if you have, you know, uh, somebody who's come from a rich background, you know, that's going to be kind of piss off a lot of the people who didn't uh, come from that background and vice versa. So, I mean, it really depends on the subject. Some things are universal, like you say, like beating kids, obviously that's terrible. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't think it's a, a black and white line, as a lot of people would say. Um, I think things are a lot more gray in real life than than people make it out to be. So, I mean, that's I mean, it's the truth of everything, right? It's everything exists more or less in a gray area. And I think people in our current political climate fail to see that too often, where they want to look at their political opponents as uh, villains of some type. Um, and especially in the, the Democratic primary right now, there's so much hostility on the internet from one camp to the next. Uh, you know, Bernie's a bad guy. Pete's a liar. You know, Joe Biden's a racist. These these very hyperbolic statements about each candidate, not from the candidates themselves, but from their supporters. How do we get the discourse to a point where we're saying, I disagree with this guy. I don't think he's the best choice, but I understand that he's like probably not a horrible human. Like wh where's the defining line? Yeah. How do we how do we get? Well, I think that's um, largely a symptom of the fact that we only have two parties, and everyone, regardless of their political views, are being crammed into one of two camps. So, I mean, a lot of us on the left really think the Democratic Party is not is not our party. Uh, we would rather have, you know, some kind of social democratic or democratic socialist party, or just a straight socialist party. To be honest, uh, uh, so, but you know, the whole thing of um, we have to vote blue because Republicans are worse. Um, that's it doesn't sit right with a lot of people, and the same goes for the Republican Party. There are some Republicans, you know, the Libertarian Party, for example. Those folks are anti-war, uh, pro marijuana legalization, you know, pro gun rights, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but not all those policy positions drive with the Republican Party, so uh, they don't fit in there. So there should be a, you know, a, a legitimate uh, multi-party system to where it would be representative of people and their their positions on on the issues. Uh, that's something I would look forward to to trying to change somehow is to get out of this duopoly system where. We essentially have two of the same parties that uh, run on the same war platform, the same economic platform. Uh, they're just one of them is not racist or not, not as racist as the other one. So I, I don't know. We need to get away from that system, in my opinion, somehow. So so like I'll say this because like, I'm, I'm firmly someone who agrees that the two party system is, is innately flawed because the, the political spectrum is just it's too broad, you know, um, but I, I always disagree with this concept that, that you know the the Democratic Party is more or less the same as the Republican Party. Because um, I mean, fundamentally, it, it really isn't true from their from the platforms to to the candidates they put forward. I mean, the Republican Party, especially today, but really for the last thirty years, is so far to the right. You know, they don't even kind of exist within the sphere of kind of Western liberalism uh, as like, you know, this country is defined by. Uh, and I think the opposite of that is that you have a democratic party who just encompasses all of those ideologies from 
kind of like center right conservatism all the way out to social democracy, anything that exists within kind of that Western political heritage uh, and kind of these, these basic ideas of, of justice, equality, you know, uh, personal liberty, um, and you know, whether it be negative or personal or, or positive liberty, they're all sandwiched into one party right now while you have one party that increasingly moves to authoritative politics. I see that as a strong difference. I mean, I get where you're coming from um, to a degree, but like I said, they um, how many Democrats supported um, Trump's budget? How many Democrats voted to uh, you know pass the presidential war powers where you know he can unilaterally go to war? Um, how many Democrats voted for the tax cuts? I mean, you see what I mean? Uh, on so many issues, they are the same party. And that is the party of the wealthy and elite and the war companies and, you know, insurance companies. All of this is this the anti-working class um, party. Uh, they differ on social issues. You know, the Democratic Party obviously doesn't hate gay people. They don't have, hate black people. They don't <laughs> hate women. Uh, so there's there's that and i agree that's obviously a strong difference but that's all of those issues are issues that don't really offend the powers that both parties work together uh to represent you see what i mean i mean i mean absolutely and and i i don't disagree with you on the idea that there are there are a number of elected democrats and a number of democrats running who who are absolutely uh, not interested in ending poverty, or at least that their ideology certainly, or their, their policy prescriptions to do so, certainly won't accomplish that. Uh, let's be honest, I mean, there's a lot of Democrats today who are elected or who are running for office in places who have far more in common with you know Eisenhower than they do, or even Nixon, than they do with FDR or, or Kennedy, uh, for that matter. Um, but where they where they differ and where I think they get grouped back together is, you know, you think about that that classic left right spectrum, right, for mapping political ideology, which is like a ter it's a terrible map. It it doesn't work. We know that. But if you were to do it right, what defines rightward ideology is a commitment to to centralizing authority. You know, mm -hmm. so you have your 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 long list of kind of rightist. Um, you know, ideologies that are based on you know, whether it's monarchism or, or fascism, etc. And everything kind of sparing out to the left is supposed to be based on liberation and one way to achieve it or another, right? My, my view on it is that that's the fundamental kind of underlying difference between the two parties at this yep. point in American history is that one is so far over here and so committed to just strong man politics and the other is just trying to encompass everything else right now. And I, that's the issue. I mean, I, I, I get it, but I still kind of disagree. I mean, the democratic party, uh, in 2016, that, that was a very authoritative move. They pulled where they were not going to let the actual voters decide the candidate. And they picked the candidate themselves. And they even, you know, they went to the lawsuit, the DNC fraud lawsuit, and they won that lawsuit. It's going back up, I think, now to the Supreme Court. But they won that lawsuit on the argument that as a party, they have the right to pick the candidate. They're a private institution, and they have the right to pick who they want to be their representative. Um, and so to, to, to call them really democratic, I think, is... Um, misleading, even though their name is the Democratic Party. And they're pulling it again in 2020. Um, you know, just uh, Tom Perez just released that list of nominees. I don't know if you saw that for the, the committee, um, the, the convention committees. Uh, and who's on those com co committees? Uh, you've got pro health insurance lobbyists, you've got uh, pro fracking people, you have Walmart uh, representatives, uh, restaurant association representatives. I mean, how are we supposed to get these policies that we want passed if if this is consistently the representation that the Democratic Party puts forward uh, to set the rules, 
uh, and et cetera. Um, I just, I, I, <laughs> I can't be comfortable calling them democratic really in, in almost any way, sadly. Well, I mean, that's, and that's, to me, I think that's one of the fundamental issues in our election system. You know, people always forget that, I mean, essentially voters had no say at all in the primary selection process until like 68. Um, but I mean, yeah, legally that is, the, that, that is the thing. You know, anyone can file to run for president, to, but to, to be the nominee, you have to get through, of a, of a political party, you have to get through their insiders uh, and through their established process. And, and the issue really with the two main parties is that there's, there's no standardization to their process at all. It's, it was set by party leaders Many of those rules have barely been updated since 68 when they really kind of rolled that out. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's so, so different and varied from one state to the next. Do you think there should be more of a, a public infrastructure to how political parties conduct themselves? Like, should there be laws designed to, to say, look, yes, you're technically a private entity, but because mm-hmm. you're so vital to the election process, like, this is what you have to follow in every state. Yeah. No, in my opinion, we, we should nationalize both parties. I mean, just to be frank, uh, they should not be run as a private, almost corporations, uh, that they get to pick the president who, uh, who you know, rules our, our day-to-day lives almost. Uh, I think they should be nationalized because uh, we don't have any say in who, uh, how the rules are written and, you know, who they nominate for what. Uh, again, it's just if you want to get into that, um, you know, framework where you have a, a, a say, you have to go through, you know, the local thing to really register as a, a delegate and whatnot. And then you, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to get somewhere within the Democratic Party where you finally have a chance to say who um, who does what and, and how the rules are made. Um, but that that process is not attainable for the vast majority of people. Yeah, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, you look at, a, uh, you look at the Iowa caucuses, for example, and I mean, the, the Republican process is a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more common sense than the democratic one, but they're still, both of them are a mess. And I think they, they get what between two and 5% voter turnout for those things. I mean, that's, it's insane. <laughs> it's pretty sad. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it's not possible. I mean, it, it's not like you just go in and fill out a ballot. You have to go sit there for hours, you know, and, and literally verbally argue with other people for who support other candidates. I mean, it's, it, it's yeah, such a no sense to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a bizarre process. Um, and that, that's, I think that is an issue because, because in that post 68 landscape, we were, we were taught that, you know, our primary vote, matters and, and this and that, but people, you know, think that they're voting directly for a candidate to be the nominee of the party they're registered as, not realizing that's, you know, on paper, not what they're doing at all. They are simply trying, they're voting to give an indication to a private entity of who the most popular person might be. So that party has an idea of what their best chances to, you know, to win a general election. Right. Uh, those are very different things, and people don't understand what, what process they're actually participating in. Right. And then once we tell them who we want to be the nominee, then really the electoral college takes over and, you know, really elects the person. Right. We don't, we have very little say in who our actual uh, leaders are, to be honest. So. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. I mean, it took a, a constitutional amendment. To, to get you know, direct election of U.S. senators, um, and I mean part of this, I mean you know very candidly, a lot of a lot of a lot of rules when it comes to general elections were, were put in place simply because it was so difficult to accurately hold, maintain, and record that many votes in the past. Um, it's not, and it hasn't been for many many decades that hard to count votes why are we struggling to put new laws in place? I mean, the two, you know, the two party system has a vested interest in keeping things how it is. Uh, they can't let too much control get to the people and because that will threaten their 
I guess their kind of livelihood, uh, threaten their power. So it, it really is uh, an unfortunate kind of indictment on our country that this is the way things are run. Um, but that's where things are. We don't have a lot of say and they keep things the way they are because right now the way things are, they have the power um, to do what they want. So. so we are getting kind of kind of close to our end here. I want to just lightning around some questions at you. Sound sure. good? Yeah. All right. Single most important issue to you. What is it? Um, climate change. What do you intend to do about it? Uh, we need to pass a Green New Deal to get to net zero carbon emissions, um, reinvest trillions of dollars in the infrastructure and green jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we could go on for a, lot, a long time on this, but. Um, you know, moving from there, uh, if someone's, let's say I'm coming to South Carolina, where are you taking me to eat? Ooh, <laughs> um, I might go, so I'm in the Charleston kind of area. I might go to a uh, home team barbecue in West Ashley is a good place. Home team barbecue. All right. Uh, what, what makes you a better choice than Harrison? In one sentence, what makes you a better choice than Harrison? Um, Harrison is a former lobbyist who takes his poly policy positions based off of polling, not based off of uh, kind of the gut uh, of what really matters, uh, representing the working people. All right. Um, if you beat Harrison and you go on to face Graham, what's your strategy? Uh, Anti-war, show how he's not really for the people. He voted in 2018 to cut Social Security by billions of dollars, among other things. I mean, they just, I feel like South Carolina electorate like votes for him because we've always had him for a long time and they think he's on our team, but he's not really on the, the team of the people. All right. Well, Justin, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on and spending this, uh, this time with me uh, on the very first episode of this. Um, I look forward to speaking with you again in the future and possibly not being, you know, allowed to call you Justin anymore. So <laughs> Godspeed, right. future Senator Wooten. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. Take care now.